Hello, everyone. Welcome to Enhancing Visual Design with Web Accessibility. My name is Mirela Prifti. I'm a designer and developer and an accessibility advocate. I'm the co-founder of Matex, a consulting company for web design and development and open source software development. And I'm based in London, UK. Hi, everyone. I'm Carmia Weidemann. I'm the creative director at Approachable Systems, which is a marketing agency based in the United States. We love using the Webflow platform for our clients because you can easily blend the technical aspect of website building with the creative design side. In this presentation, we'll go through concepts of visual design and web accessibility, how to build accessibly in Webflow, who should take care of the accessibility of a website project, and how to create systems to make the implementation of accessibility best practices sustainable in the long term. A natural question might be, what brings me and Carmia together? We're both Webflow developers, although with a very different approach when it comes to design. But ultimately, the goal of our work is creating visually pleasant and user-friendly web experiences. And for both personal and professional reasons, we believe that the way to achieve this is through accessibility. And now Carmia is going to show her experience and perspectives when it comes to design and web accessibility. Today, we will talk about visual design and accessibility and how the two complement each other. So firstly, to explore the relationship between the two, we need to understand what they represent. Visual design is a way that we communicate. We do so by using visual elements such as layout, color, typography, icons, and illustrations. And through these elements, we evoke emotions within the user that may include fear, happiness, trust, or surprise. Moving on to web accessibility. What is web accessibility? It's a term we hear all the time these days. So what is it? It is the practice of making sure that your website can be used by as many people as possible. The more accessible your website is, the more users it will reach because you will be catering to a larger and more diverse audience. So now that we know what both of these terms mean, I would like to present you with a simple question. Are visual design and web accessibility mutually exclusive? Can we achieve an optimal web design without using them together? So before you answer this question, I would like to show you a couple of examples on how we can check and review the accessibility of our designs. So how does Webflow help connect visual design and accessibility? Webflow has a couple of native tools that help web designers and developers achieve this perfect blend between design and accessibility. So in the next couple of slides, I will show you examples of how Webflow helps us. First, I will show you the color contrast checker. I use this quite often. So it's a great way to check your design's text contrast. If you have a look above your color swatches on the right, you will see an eye icon and the phrase contrast ratio. So with your text box selected, you will see a rating. The best rating to have is three A's. And on the opposite spectrum of that is a fail rating, which surprisingly is not ideal for an accessible web design. So you can play around with your color and select the circle that you see within the colors, move your mouse below the lines, above the lines, in between the two lines, and then you will see that you get a pass rating when you're in between those two lines. And that is ideal and that's what we would like for our design and for accessibility. So similar to the color contrast checker, Webflow has a color blindness checker where you can view your site through a lens that takes certain colors away and it even has a blurry vision lens. This makes you view your site through the eyes of a visually impaired user, and it gives you valuable insight on whether your fonts are readable once they get blurry. So a lot of the times you will find that your text probably needs to be bigger after you do this blurry vision test. For users that rely on screen readers, this next tool is extremely important. Webflow has included an audit panel where we can see where we are missing image alt text and where we skipped heading levels. If you follow this audit panel, it's a great way to improve your site's performance on Google. And also by adding descriptive alt text to explain your images means that the user will have the best experience. And as a bonus, it also helps boost your SEO value for your site. Forms might be the most valuable feature that a website can have. 
We receive important leads through them and we need to ensure that they work 100%. This includes making them easy to understand and to complete for a successful submission. So as someone who struggles with focus sometimes, I can definitely see the value of leaving a little reminder above my type field of what I'm supposed to be filling in versus the opposite of where the placeholder text disappears when I start typing. So I think it's definitely important to label your form fields. It's good for design and it's essential for UX. On to my last tool that I'd like to share with you. Mobile readiness is something I focus on quite heavily for my web performance. Coming from South Africa, I know that not everyone has access to a desktop and mainly gets their information through mobile phones. So Webflow has responsive design and it gives you the ability to individually edit your mobile, tablet and desktop designs. So I would like to get hand this over to Mirella now. So we just heard Karen's experience with how she uses Webflow's native tools to make her websites more accessible. But what happens when we work with a larger team where the responsibility lines might be more blurred and who should be in charge of accessibility in that case? To shed a bit more light to this, to this question, I've created this simple graphic where I've included a few aspects of web accessibility and the three main roles that are involved in a website project. There are so many aspects of accessibility that might go from content creation to development, and so are typically the number of people involved in a website project. So for example, the person who is in charge, the copywriter that might be in charge of writing and curating a blog post should also take care of the old text of the images that are part of that blog post. And the person who is in charge of the Webflow project makes sure that the old text is properly set to the project. Now, this might be an ideal situation, uh, but the idea is that accessibility is a team effort. And even if you're a team of one, you might use this graphic to understand at what stage of the project you should handle specific accessibility aspects. Moving on, I believe that it's important to create systems that support and facilitate accessibility for our projects in the long term. Carmia just showed us how to use the built-in accessibility checks provided in the Webflow platform. I like to use also annotations for guidelines and frameworks. In the past year, we're witnessing that the use of standardized systems and frameworks is increasingly growing among the Webflow community. But even if you're using your own simple guideline systems, you can always leverage annotations to provide a baseline for accessible design and development. The first thing I'd like to tackle when it comes to accessibility of a website is readability contrast for both text and non-text elements. One of the most important aspects of readability contrast is the use of color. Although it's the most visible aspect of the design, it is also the source of most of the accessibility issues that we encounter. And this is important for both text and non-text elements, such as icons, that we typically use to help people better understand content and actions. With the help of the color swatch built natively in Webflow, we can use these simple boxes that you can find on the right side of my slides as a playground where we can check and annotate if required the color contrast level. This has been very useful to me for projects when I had to rebrand a website or when I just had to test or try out different color combinations. But there's more to readability contrast than color when it comes to text. A readable text is easy to understand and consume, and this is affected by the choice of fonts, font size, font weight, and even the choice of words. This is why it's very important to provide content guidelines and check if our content is easy to read and comprehensible on different devices that our audience might use. Moving on, another aspect I believe it's key to include in our design guidelines is the page structure. As designers, we use visual elements and visual cues to provide a proper hierarchy and structure to a web page. Whatever you're building, whatever the purpose of your web page, it should always follow the logical structure of the page content, starting from the header to the main content section and the footer at the bottom. And we can technically achieve this structure by using semantic HTML elements or by giving semantic tags to our divs. 
Semantic elements help search engines and assistive technologies such as screen readers to better understand and interpret the contents of our pages. So for example, we just build the footer of our website and we pick the div that acts as the main wrapper for our footer. Then we go to the settings panel on the right and select footer in the tag dropdown. As you can also see on the right side of my slide, where there is also a representation of how typically should, should be set the semantic structure of a web page. Including these types of information and higher level patterns in our guidelines or documentation helps designers and developers make more informed decisions without ending up building randomly because of a lack of a documented and practical process to follow. The next aspect I'd like to mention is about ARIA attributes applied on interactive elements. ARIA stands for Accessible Rich Internet Applications. And with interactive elements, we mean links, videos, form controls, models, and so on. ARIA attributes communicate information about interactive elements to assistive technologies. Most of the native interactive elements and components in Webflow are already accessible. However, oftentimes we are required to build custom components for our projects, and one of the most common ones are models. For example, the first thing we do when building a model is adding the link element to the canvas, which acts as a trigger for the model to open. Then we build the rest of the component. Link elements are used to take you to another web page or to another section within the same page. In this case, we're using it as a button. So we need to give it the row button. And we can do this by selecting the link elements. Then we go to the settings panel on the right to find the custom attribute section that you can also see on the right side of my slide. And there we add the attribute row and write button in the value field. But we also need a description of what happens when we click on that button. And for this purpose, we can add an ARIA label attribute and type open model in the value field or something more specific based on the context. As easy as it may seem implementing uh, ARIA attributes, they can be very complex and challenging sometimes. And I strongly recommend relying on the official documentation provided by WebAIM before using them. WebAIM stands for Web Accessibility in Mind and is the organization that establishes the guidelines and recommendations for web accessibility at an international level. The last thing I'd like to talk about is animations and motions. This is a very sensitive topic in the WebTool community and some people love them, others are against them, and some others might just find them annoying. I believe we all agree that sometimes animations and interactions dramatically improve or enhance user experience. Other times, they might get in the way of a good UX or just be irrelevant without adding anything of value. When choosing animations, it's important that we do not rely mainly on our personal preferences. There should be a thought process behind that goes beyond aesthetics reasons. And that's why it's important to provide a baseline for accessible animations and interactions. We should make sure that the content would still make sense even without animations on a page, or where possible, provide a functional, non-animated alternative to our users. One thing to consider is that Windows and Mac operating systems provide us with the ability to disable animations on a system level. So if you're a Windows user, you can do this by going to system settings, then go to accessibility, click on visual effects, and there you'll find the option to enable or disable animation effects. If you're using a Mac computer, you need to go to system preferences, accessibility, then among the display settings, you'll find the option reduce motion. If you have a page or section that will break or just not make sense without the main animation supplied, with a little bit of custom code, you can still provide a working version of your section to the people who have disabled animations on their devices. And by working version, I mean an alternative that might not necessarily be without animations at all, but with a smoother animation version 
that would not cause trouble or annoy anyone. Having said that, it's not easy to make everybody happy at all times with our work. There are always going to be trade-offs and there are no perfect ways to build animations or interactions, just like there's no such thing as building 100% accessible websites all the time. However, I'd like to leave you with a quote and then you can draw your own conclusions. This quote is by a remarkable Italian designer and inventor, Bruno Munari, that says, a designer is a planner with aesthetic sense. I love this quote and it resonates with me because from my experience, good and bad, I design better and stronger if I plan aid. So as designers, I think we have to design with accessibility in mind and not as an afterthought or a checklist item. This brings us back to my initial question. Are visual design and web accessibility mutually exclusive? I would say the answer is no. Visual design is not complete without accessibility. You are not taking full advantage of the web if you do not reach all possible users. And with this, our presentation has come to an end. Thank you everyone for watching. If you have any questions or anything you'd like to share with me and Carmia, you can find us on LinkedIn and Twitter. And you can find samples of our work on our official web profiles. Thank you again for joining us. We hope this has been helpful to you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.